I have uh, I have a lot I want to say to you this morning. I've just felt all my body this morning just a heat like a like a fire. I've, I've adjusted that thermostat several times, and I promise you, I don't have fever. I, I really believe it's it's this word that the Lord has put in my heart. There was a prophet in the Bible who said that the word of God was in his heart like a fire shut up in his bones. And uh, just going to trust the Lord to help me say and to help me to deliver what I, what I believe He's given me this morning. I, I want to turn to several places in the Word with you. But I just want to start out this morning by... I want to tell you of the love that I have for this church and for this body and how I pray for you and I care about you. And I've been asking God for years to give me a shepherd's heart. And when I think of a shepherd, I think of one who studies his flock. That's his number one priority in his life is that he thinks and he meditates and he looks after the people that are around him because he cares. I can promise you I'd never do this for personal gain or recognition. I'm just here today because I love Jesus and I love the body of Christ. I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. And I believe in revival, meaning that I believe that God can do great and incredible things right here in our town. And there has to be a preparation of a people to get it done. I don't believe some dream team of Christians is going to wade through our community, Richard, and reach our town for the Gospel's sake. We're here. We're the ones that are called to do it. And so everything in your life, God is preparing the things that you go through, the things that you walk through, you've got to stop looking at it as poor me, I'm I'm always under the gun, I'm always under the radar, and begin to look at it. God is equipping me. God is preparing me. I can come out of this valley defeated and broken down, or I can come out on the other side with another testimony of the greatness of my God and what that devil meant for evil right in his face. God turned it around for my good. And what I want to begin to say to you this morning, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse 9. He says, Hebrews 4 and 9, he says, There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. The reason that the rest remains is because there were a people who died outside of the promised land that God had for them. There were people, that that nation Israel, that come out of the bondage of Egypt. There were a people who had great and incredible promises prophesied over them. I'm going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to take you to a land of plenty. I'm going to take you to a land where there's green pastures and still waters and you're going to eat from vineyards and gardens that you didn't plant. You're going to live in houses that you didn't build. That's the greatness of God. That's the promise over their life. But how many of you know because of unbelief, because of fear, because they allowed the lies of the enemy to be so big in their life, They never got there. They died in the wilderness. They went in so many circles. Aren't you tired, y'all, of going in circles? Aren't we tired of a, a few good services and then we're right back where we were, defeated and disappointed and in our, in our own self-pity. I'm so done with that. I'm moving with God. I'm going to that promised land. I know we're going to see revival in our town, but we can't do it in the wilderness. We've got to get to that promised land. We have got to enter in to that rest. The word rest, it, it, it speaks of supernatural peace that only God can bring. That's where they're headed. Look in verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works as God did from His. Listen in verse 11. Let us labor therefore 
to enter into that rest, lest any man fall under the same example of unbelief. The word labor there, it, it seems like a strange, strange verse. Let's labor to enter in to the rest. The word labor there in verse 11, it means speed. Let's quickly, quickly enter into the rest of God. Why? Because we don't have time to waste in the wilderness. I don't know about you, but I've wasted enough time in my life. I've wasted enough time going around in circles. I've wasted enough time in excuses and feeling sorry for myself. I wasted enough time living for the devil for most of my life. I don't have another day to give to him. Today is that day of salvation. People are dying and going to hell every moment, every hour. I don't have time to waste and go in circles. So with speed, listen, the word labor, it also speaks of effort. You're going to have to put forth an effort to get into the rest of God. To some of you, it was a fight just to get here to this house this morning. But enter in that fight to get here. When you enter into the presence of God, what a rest comes. That was your effort. That was your fight to fight hell, to be where God wants you to be. It also means diligence. Diligence means you keep on. You do your best. Your own task. You're there. You're faithful. You're present. And you are accounted for. That's what it means to be diligent. Remember Hebrews 11.6, it says that without faith it's impossible to please God. But he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. That's people that don't give up. I'm seeking God. I'm pressing into God. If I don't get what I want today, I'll be back tomorrow. Some of you seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If it didn't happen today, be in the altar tonight. Ask people to pray for you and lay hands on you because it is coming. Diligently seek God for His will for your life. Listen in verse 12 though. He, 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 he says, verse 11, labor to enter into that rest so you don't fall after the same example of unbelief. You know what that means? It can happen to you. If it happened to a people that saw a Red Sea parted, water come out of a smitten rock, manna outside their tent every morning. How many of you have ever seen that? No. It can happen to you. You can fall under unbelief. Unbelief can keep can, can take over your heart. Look in verse 12 though what he says. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner. That, that word discern means it judges you. The Word of God judges and it proves and it tries your life. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. As I'm reading this, as God was giving this to me, I thought, what a contradiction that is. <laughs> Pete, what a contradiction. We're talking about rest. We're talking about entering into the rest of God. And then the writer of Hebrews, he starts talking about a sword. Sword means war. War and rest are complete opposite. If you've got a sword, then you're not there for rest. You're there for war. If you're in war, then the last thing that you're having is rest. And God began to give me the understanding of these verses is first must come the sword if you're ever going to have rest in your life. First must come the sword if you're ever going to have rest in your life. And I really wrestled with this because I know we live in a day and age where Christians like the Word of God as long as it don't touch my life. Christians like the Word of God as long as it's not to me, as long as it's not dealing with me and with what I've got going on in my life. Preach on, preacher. As long as you're not preaching to me. People like the sword as long as they're the one holding it and using it on other people. 
But if you ever want to enter into the spiritual rest that God has for you, then you've got to allow that sword to come and be applied to your own life. I can promise you there's not a one of us in here that's as spiritual as you think you are. There's not a one of us in here this morning that it is as close to God as you think you are. You know what God's answer to it is? He wants you to have rest in your life. But first must come the sword. Because whatever it is that's separating you from God, it's in your own heart. It's in that your own heart of unbelief. And if we don't let the sword come, if I don't, if you don't, you know where we'll be, Matt? Forty years going around in circles. Blaming other people. Mad at God. Mad at Moses. Spewing out, griping, poisoning. And we're never ever going to be what God has called. But if I let that sword come and touch my life. Oh God, that I have things in my heart that don't belong there. I have attitudes. I, I have unbelief. I have grudges. I have unforgiveness. I have attitudes that are not right. I didn't learn them from my Heavenly Father. I learned them in this lost world. You know what God's answer to it? The sword. Come, purge it and get rid of it. Come and de deliver my heart of everything that's unrighteous and ungodly. You know that's what God did. Joshua entered into the promised land with a sword. There were giants there. There were Canaanites there. There were Hittites, Gergesites, Jebusites, Hivites. There were seven different enemies occupying the land that Joshua and all of Israel were meant to have. You know what it's going to take if, you have, if you're going to have rest in the land? Then you've got to have that sword. And one by one, you're going to drive them out of the land. That's what God does. That's what His Word does. And a lot of people have no rest in their life because they haven't allowed the sword to come and to cut away things that need to be pruned out of their heart and out of their life. God wants you to have rest. God wants us to have rest in this church. God wants us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and not stay on the same level all the time, but keep growing. Keep, keep growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Abound in His grace so that we're not always wrestling with ourselves, but so that we can make an impact in the community that we live in. Now turn with me in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. I brought that to you to say, we're going to pick up that sword. How many of you know this is that sword? Amen. This is that sword. And it's not there to hurt you. It's there to help you. I read a scripture this morning. Let me, let me give it to you. It's Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 10. It says, cast out the scorner and strife will, strife will cease. In other words, get rid of where the problem's coming from and you won't have any more problems. I want to say to you this morning, as I've told you a hundred times, the biggest problem in your life, you looked at it in the mirror when you got ready this morning. And that's what the sword will always deal with. There's been so many times, Nathan, I want to take this sword and I want to hack somebody else with it. I want to use this sword against them. But you know what I've had to learn? I can't control what God does in somebody else's life. I can pray. I can hope. I can believe. I can beg. And I have begged God for some people. And, and for some of those prayers, they haven't been answered yet. Some of those people I'm praying for, instead of getting better, it looks to me like they're getting worse. And I've let that affect me in my walk with God at times. But you know what I've had to realize? I can't control what you do, brother. I can't control what you do, sister. The only thing I have in this race is to deny myself, pick up that cross, and follow Jesus. And while He may not change you, if my heart will be right before Him, He will change me all along the way. That's what the sword does. It deals with you. And what I want to talk to you just for a few moments about this morning, I've been knowing, I've been knowing that we needed to deal with it. I've been knowing that we needed to go here and, and teach on it. Have you ever known that you needed to deal with and take care of something, but you just kind of put it off and not right now? Or things, you know, it's not as bad as you think it is. 
And then all of a sudden, it gets really bad. Yeah. You could have fixed a little problem when it was small, but now that things done got worse and worse, and now you got a big problem. A couple of years ago, we had a garden, and man, it was doing good. Best garden I've ever grown, I've ever planted. I knew in my mind, I need to spray that garden. Bugs are going to get in that garden. I need to spray. I said, well, it's doing good, and I really don't have time right now. I don't really have time to deal with it. Overnight, bugs attacked my garden. I went out there the next morning. Not a green leaf was left. They ate it row to row, front to back. Big old green worms with horns on top of their head. And you know who I had to blame this fall? One man. If you'd have sprayed that garden, that, that which was in your gut was telling you it was time to deal with it. It was time to take care of the issue. It was time to deal with the problem. Well, I want to be, with all of my heart, I want to be a shepherd for this church. I love you folks. Your problems are my problems. I want to walk with you. I can just imagine in my mind, in my spirit, one day, one day, we're going home. What if it happened right now? I'm talking about a blast so loud, it woke, it woke the dead. Every graveyard was opened up. Nothing left in here, y'all, but a bunch of rags and clothes and cell phones and perks. We're going to heaven. We walk through those gates. My God, what a day, what a day, what a day. Jesus, we're here. We're down in the You thought you were right, but you weren't. 
He didn't know you. You didn't have a relationship with Him. You never ever allowed Him to apply the sword in your life. It's one thing and it's great to worship and pray and weep around this altar. But I can tell you, sometimes that can be the soul doing that. There are people, man, I I remember driving down the road on 4th of July seeing fireworks and I began to weep thinking about this country and the greatness of it. You can be emotional about things that are not about God. But the Spirit, it's the Spirit, man, that's that born again person inside of you that craves and is hungry for the Word of God. It's that spirit man that says, God, it's not about me being right. I want to be right with you. What's your word saying to me? That's the man that Jesus said, man can't live by bread alone. Why not? They do it every day. They, they go every day, Brother Robert, without reading this word of God. They go, why not? He's talking about a spiritual man. He's talking about a born again man. You can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You've got to have it if you're going to live. There are times it will raise you up. There are times it will put you down. But it's doing a good work in your life. And if you follow this Word, I can promise you, you're going to hear one day, well done. You're a good and faithful servant because this book led you into eternal life and trusting and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're striving for, y'all. To hear one day in our life, well done, you good and faithful servant. And I know this, my life, I'll, I'll, I'll give an account to God for it in this church. I'll give an account to God for this church, for this body. In some way, I am responsible for you and for this flock. I want us to grow and to know all that God has for us in Jesus. And to mature, to be the people that He's called us to be. In this season, I'm not trying to waste time, but in this season that we're in, I know that many people are under attack by the enemy. When God begins to move, and He is moving greatly, like our sister testified this morning, but that move of God is always going to be met with a real resistance of the enemy. He never wants you to get off the ground. Have you ever felt like you take a few steps forward and then he comes to try to take? That's what the devil does. Steal, kill, and destroy. But what you have to know is that the enemy's power is not greater than the power of God. The enemy wants to control the atmosphere in your life. Have you ever just felt the weight of depression and oppression? I know you have. And he wants to spread that. It'll, it'll spill from one person to the next person. And before you know it, you've got a whole church that's depressed and oppressed. You know what needs to come? That sword has got to come and defeat the enemy and the oppression that he comes and he tries to bring. I was thinking about this morning in Luke chapter 8, there's a story when Jesus got in the boat with his disciples and said, let's go forth to the other side. And how the disciples must have felt, man, ain't this good? We're in the boat with Jesus. We're going somewhere on an adventure. And I know that God has great things for our life. But the devil opposed that. He's against that. He don't want you going anywhere. He don't want you doing anything. He wants you to stay where you are. So he sends a storm, right? The, the wind's blowing violently. The waves are splashing over the boat. And all of a sudden, they forget who's in the boat with them. Now, do you even care that we're going to drown? This boat is about to sink. Anybody ever been there? You're with Jesus, but man, it feels like I'm not going to be able to make it through to the other side. But I can tell you, there was a greater power in that boat. They went and they woke Jesus up. He went up to the top. He rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. One word, God. Just speak one word over my life. Peace be still. The wind stopped blowing. The waves were calm. And they made it through to the other side. But you have to know, when contrary winds are blowing against your life, greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Stand with Jesus on victory and begin to push back. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand and praise. Amen. So the enemy wants to control the atmosphere to make it heavy, to make it oppressive. Jesus said, I'll give you a yoke that's easy and a burden that's light. That's the freedom that's found 
walking with Jesus. And this is what I know. When the enemy begins to attack your life, he intends for that oppression to spread, get on other people, and weigh others down. I want to speak to you just for the next few moments. Just about our marriages and our families. Do you know I've studied in the Bible this week, the very first attack that came against humanity was an attack against a family. The very first thing that the devil against, did against men was he attacked a family. He attacked a marriage. He wanted to destroy that. You have to know today, y'all, that marriage is under attack in our nation. God created, what a great covenant that is. Two people, a man, God created, and hopefully we'll get to Genesis today. God created marriage between one man and one woman. And those two would become one. One flesh. That's the way God created it. That's the way that God ordained it. But look how the enemy wants to get its hand on that and say, marriage can be between anybody. Between two men. Between two women. And who are you to tell us? Well, I can tell you, I'm nobody. But God is here to tell you what marriage really ought to be. And I'm telling you, the reason that marriage has become what it is in our nation today is because people didn't fight for what the Word of God says it ought to be. And you have to know the enemy is there to attack and to destroy your marriage and to destroy your family. Look what God says in Ephesians chapter 19. No... Uh, yeah, well, we're going to start here. Listen, the reason that I want to start here, if you can remember some of what I preached to you last Sunday when we talked about oppression. And we talked about how praise is a real antidote for people that are oppressed. Right? I've never seen a person depressed or discouraged that was active in the altar praising the Lord. Instead, they shy away. They probably won't even come to church. And they're going to sit there very quiet, reserved, and still. That tells me the enemy's got victory over you. And he's cut off. He's clamped your praise. And if he can do that, he's going to take you down a deep, dark, miserable road. That's why you praise the Lord even when you don't feel like it. And ever just any way, just praise Him any way. And you can feel the presence of God begin to flood in your vehicle or in your home or wherever you are. That's because God's put, He's made that a weapon in your hand. Praise the Lord. Thank Him for His goodness. If what's going on in your life is not good right now, think back to when it was. And God did it. And believe Him and thank Him and praise Him for it. And know that He can turn what's bad in your life around for good today and even right now. So the Ephesian writer says in verse 19, Speak to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He goes on to say, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're fighting against oppression. You're fighting against the allurement of the world to draw you in and overwhelm you. How am I doing it? Well, I'm singing. <laughs> I'm making. I'm thanking God. Well, that looks foolish. I can tell you what. Israel looked mighty foolish for seven days marching around the big walls of Jericho carrying the Ark of the Covenant and the praise, but they didn't look foolish when the walls fell down. They didn't look foolish when they began to shout and heaven shouted with them and Jericho walls began to fall down. You might look foolish to the world singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, but hey, God's moving in your life. God's moving in your family. Walls are falling. Bad things are changing. I'm not depressed. I'm not going to get drunk with you after work. I'm going to a prayer meeting. I'm going to be with Jesus. I, I'm not. I don't need those things. I have something that never runs out. A well of living water. And you activate it when you begin to praise the Lord. So this is very practical. Listen in verse 21. He says, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. You know what that simply means? If I value God, I will value you. You know, one of the reasons that I'm here this morning and preaching this message is because I value you. I love you too much to lay down on you. I love you too much to abandon you and quit. And I value God, so I value you. 
I'm not looking to get out. I'm looking to get back up and let's fight again. Where's that devil at? Let's fight him together. Let's get in the altar. Let's believe for each other. Let's forgive one another. But I know people have done bad things to you. They've done them to me. I know people have said bad things to you. They've said them about me. But I can tell you what, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. And I've said a lot of bad things in my life. And all of it, Brother Robert, Jesus forgave it. And if He forgave me, you know what I can do? I can forgive you. I can forgive others. That's what we're called to do. You submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. Listen to what He says in verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You can see where all of this goes. God has a way. God has a word. God has an order. It all goes together. Listen to me. Don't take the sword to the Bible and say, I don't like that. Take that sword to your own life and say, God, help me to be that. I really want to be. I really want to be what this woman needs me to be. And I want God to help her to be what I need her to be and what our family needs us to be. He goes on to say, Why well, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands. There's a word for husbands. It's not just to wives. There's a word to husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. That says to you men that your love for your wife is to be a sacrificial love. That means that you're to be willing to lay your own life down for the well-being of your wife, for the well-being of your family. When He says to the wife, wife, submit to your husband. It doesn't mean that the man is in control of his wife and everything that she says or does. Listen, to the word submit... It means order. How many of you know that God has an order? God has a way of doing things. There's an order in this church, but guess what? There's freedom in this church. There really is. I don't know this woman. She asked me this morning to share that testimony. And I'm just fearful of letting anybody and whosoever. But however, on the same time, I don't want to stop what God is doing. But there's an order. We come in. We begin to pray. We begin to worship God. You know what that does? That opens things up to the Spirit. Your heart is ready to receive now the Word of God. God's going to work in our heart around this altar. There's an order. Listen, there's an order in your home. I don't believe I'll have time to get to it all today, but this is the order. The Bible says in Genesis 1.26 that God created man in His own image and His own likeness. Male and female, He created them. I don't need to enter into the arguments of atheists. I'm not an atheist. I believe in a real creation. In six days, God made everything that was made. God made you. God made me. It goes on to say in the next chapter that God formed that man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that man became a living soul. That's what God did. That's where you came from. You were created by the hands of God. For God. Your body was created to be the temple of God. That's why you have hands. Lift them up and worship God. That's why you have a voice. You can manipulate that and speak hatred and trash out of your mouth. Or God says the high praises of heaven can fill your mouth and you can worship God in spirit and in truth. We gave you your body to do that. I don't know about you. I'm sure I do. I've done things with my body that didn't glorify God. But I'm thankful that He redeems our body. He redeems our life from destruction. And our body is made to be, if we're born again, our body is made to be the temple of God. And God put that man, Adam, in the garden. And He gave him a job. He gave him a task. He gave him authority over all the animals. And He got to name them all. And it was wonderful. A perfect garden. He got to tend the garden and walk with God in the cool of the day. But then the Bible says that God looked at the man and saw it's not good for that man to be alone. 
You know what? For that to be alone meant that that man was isolated. He was by himself. He had all the animals, all the garden, and everything. But it's not good for that man to be alone. So God said, "I'm going to make a helpmate for that man." You know what a helpmate in the Hebrew it means? Well, it means a helper. It means an aid. I looked it up this morning. It means one who's able to walk with you through times of distress and trouble. That's what that helpmate was. That's what God created Eve to be. God made a deep sleep to come upon Adam. And while he was laying there asleep, he reached into him and pulled out a rib. And God took that rib and he made, he created, he fashioned a woman and gave him to that man. You know what I found was interesting through all that? God created in that man a need for his wife. God created in that woman a need for her husband. You know what that means? They need each other. They need each other. Men, you need your wife. Why? You need your husband. And it's all right to be that way because God created you to be that. I need my wife. I need her for physical things. I don't even know how to pay a phone bill. Never in my life pay the phone bill. They just cut the phone off if it was up to me to pay the phone bill. I don't know how to do it. A water bill. None of that. I don't. She takes care of that. But listen, there are things in our life that I do that my wife is not able to do. God created me with that ability. God put that inside of me. And when we work together, that's not for me to say I do things you don't do or her to say to me I do things. We need one another in our home to walk together, to be what God has created us to be. We need each other also for spiritual needs. You know what I need? I need her support. I need her to be with me. That's what God had in mind when He created that helpmate to be in the garden with Adam. Adam needs this woman to stand with him. Adam needs this woman to strengthen him. Adam needs this woman to encourage him, to support him, to be with him. And this woman needs Adam in the same token to, to meet other needs, to be there together in the garden. But listen, that was the first thing that the devil attacked. You have to be very careful, man. God put Adam in that garden to work. He did. I believe it working. Believe me, I do. You can come with me and see. I really do. But it, it's very important that you don't allow that work to define your life. Because here's the truth of it. While Adam was working in the garden, the devil was talking to his wife. While Adam was busy doing what he needed to do, the devil was talking to his wife. Can I tell you, there needs to be in our nation now a clear definition of what manhood really is. A clear restoring of what a man really ought to be. I'm thankful in my life to have grown up around real men. That's what I always wanted to be was a man. I wanted to get in the pen with the bad cows. I wanted to rope them. I wanted to ride the horse. I wanted to drive the tractor. I wanted to run the chainsaw. I want to turn the wrench. I want to get in there and do it. That's all I ever wanted to be was that kind of man. I'm thankful to have grown up around that. You know what? One of the intentions that God has for men to be for their home, a protector and a defender. You know what I do? I weep and I fear for some children. Because their parents, their father, has just laid down. And you know what happens, men, when you lay down on the job? You leave the door wide open for the devil to come in there and destroy your family and to destroy your children. You are to be the line of defense. And if the devil's going to get my family, he's going to have to come through me. Who am I? I'm the man clothed with the whole armor of God and filled with the Holy Ghost with a sword and a shield in my hand. That's what you're called and created to do. Men, what would you do? If in the middle of the night, it's midnight, you hear a bang and a commotion, there's a robber, there's a murderer coming through the door of your house. I, I believe any of you men, you'd be the first one to meet him. 
You're not touching my family. You're not getting in my house. You're not touching my wife as long as I'm here. I'm the defense of it. I'm the defender of it. I had a dream a couple months ago. I was laying in my bed asleep. And I had a dream. There was a witch standing right there at my, at my bedside. And she said to me, I've come to take everything you've got. I sat straight up in that bed. I felt fear. I felt cold chills all over me. You know what I did? I went and I got me a pistol. And I started walking all through my house. I could feel it. And the thought occurred to me, you can't shoot the spirit of witchcraft. But you know what I said? No, but I can shoot a witch, and I'm going to. And she's in that house. I went to every room in my house. I checked every sleeping child in my house. I went and I looked, and of course, nothing was in there. I don't really know what that was all about, but that's what I'll be, a defender to my home. If, they, if, if a natural enemy was trying to get in there, then you would be there at the door to protect and to defend your home. But men, what do you do? When spiritual enemies come and they attack your home. What do you do when the serpent begins to talk to your wife, plant lies in her head? What do you do when the serpent's been talking to your children, plant lies because it is happening? And the only defense for it is the Word of God. Can I tell you the answer is not getting mad and attacking them because they're in a bad mood. The answer is not attacking them because they don't want to talk at the moment. You know what they need? They need somebody just as well in the natural that would pretend, protect them and defend them. Somebody there in the spiritual that will be able to pray them through and bring the Word of God into that situation. You know what? Wives, what your husband needs you to be in that home needs you to be in divine order. That man's there as the head of that household just like Jesus is the head of this church. Just like we're all accountable to Him. Just like I'm under Him as an under-shepherd. And I'm going to lead as He leads. And I just need you to help me. And don't fight against me. And let's work together. You have gifts that I don't have. I'm so glad that worship team was back today. Because they have gifts that I don't have. I could never say to Kyle, I don't need you. You've got no place in this church. The truth is I do. I, we need that worship team. But we all need one another. That's the way it is in that home. And God puts that man at the head of that household. A man that fears God. A man that loves God. A man that walks with God and loves his family. And then under that, there's a wife. The restoration of biblical womanhood. What does that look like? What is a biblical woman? I can tell you what she is. She's virtuous. You know what she is? She's kind. You know what she is? She's a servant of the people that she loves. There's a woman in the Bible named Rebecca. There was a man named Abraham who had a son named Isaac who he needed to get a wife for his son before he died. Sent him to a faraway land to find a bride for his son. And when he got there, you know what he was looking for? A servant. This young, beautiful girl, you know what she was doing? She was at the well pulling out buckets of water and pouring it out for the thirsty servants of God, for their camels, for their livestock. You know what? She wasn't asked to do that. She wasn't forced to do that. That was in her heart. You know what I believe? That's a biblical woman. I want to serve with the water of life. I want to serve my family. I want to serve the people that are around me. Why? Because the heart of Christ is being formed in me. I believe that a, a biblical woman, a biblical marriage, that man protects his home. So does the wife. She looks over the children. There's things in our children's lives. There's things that I do that my wife doesn't do. But there's things that my wife is able to do that I'm not able to do in the lives of these children. We need each other. If we work against each other, then we're, we're, all we're going to do is destroy our own household. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself, it can never stand. The enemy is there always to attack to destroy. He's the enemy of unity in the church. He's the enemy of unity within the house. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And in God's divine order of things, the man and the wife are on the same page. We're moving with God. I want what's best for my family. I can tell you, I don't want to go to heaven and know that my children didn't make it. 
I don't want to have preacher's kids. I've seen a lot of preacher's kids that I don't think they know Jesus and they don't want to be in church and they don't want to be with God. And they grew up being the worst things. I can't have that. I don't want that in my home. I want children that love Jesus. I want my life to be an example. I want my sons and my little girl to know what it is to live and to love and to worship God. Why? Because they saw it in my life, Brother Robert, that I was that, Richard, that times surely I did fail. I ask Him to forgive me. I get up again. We move together in one heart and in one accord. And as we're doing that, guess what? We're not giving place to the enemy to destroy and to attack our home. That's what God created for it to be. You might be here today and you say, yeah, brother, that sounds nice, but you don't know the things that have gone on in my life and in my home. I do know this. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says in Adam, all die. Adam was there doing his best, maybe his family, that, that marriage died. That family died. They were separated from God. If there's sin in your life, listen, the first thing it's going to do is separate you from God. But secondly, that it's going to creep over in your home. There's going to be division now in your marriage. There's going to be division in your home. There's going to be oppression in your home. That enemy's looking to get in. He'll get in through you. He'll get in through any way that you let him. And Adam all die. As long as you keep trying to do it your way. As long as we blame each other. There are times in your marriage, sometimes we don't see eye to eye. Amen, somebody? Amen. Sometimes it's hard. That's why people get divorced and give up on each other and walk away. Because it's not easy. It's hard. But there's times you got to look at it and say, it's not worth me winning this argument. I want my family to be together so I'll lay down my weapons and call on Jesus and love each other through it. Apologize when you're wrong. Forgive when you are wrong. And guess what? Things get stronger. Things get better. You move on with God. I can tell you what, there's nothing like going home to people that love you, is it? I got me a saying, no matter where I go, if you want to get rid of me on my job, guess what? I can always go home. I don't have to have this job to be loved in my home. I'm going to go play football with my boys in the yard and I'm going to hug my wife and I'm going to get in that little Toyota with my two dogs and check house tomorrow. I don't have to do this. I can always go home. A home is a special place to be. A home is a gift from God. Your husband, your wife, that's exactly what they are. They're a gift from God to you. And if there's trouble there, if there's problems there, then I want to tell you, the person sitting beside you is not the root of it. That snake's been whispering like he always does. And the only way to combat it is get back to the Word of God. No. How many of you believe that God has a plan for your family? Amen. How many of you believe that God can really do incredible things in your family? You really believe that? That it's not too late that God really can. And you know what you have to do? You have to put all of those problems in Christ. That verse I was quoting to you, in Adam all die, but even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Your family can make it. Your marriage can make it. Your children can make it. Richard, that little boy, did you see him up here this morning? on his knees, hands lifted up, worshiping God. I can tell you, all God's moving. God has things that He wants to do. It starts with the head of the house. Men, you need to lead the way into the presence of God. You need to lead the way into that altar. You're big in the eyes of your family. Don't be too big to worship God. I just had this thought as I got to, was on my, on my way to church this morning. If you can't get your kids in church to an altar to worship Jesus, what do you think is going to happen when they go to college? And there's an atheist professor that hates the name of Jesus, and he's got every uh, history book, science book, and every evidence to show you 
your little girl, your little boy, that that chance is just a made up lie. You're going to lose them. You know why? Because you laid down when you should have stood up. You gave up when you should have fallen. I believe you know your family is worth fighting for. And the weapons are in your hand. Here's it, here it is. God says there's a rest for you, for the people of God. But first, in order for there to be rest, that sword has to come to drive out all the enemies. And if the devil's in your house, you ain't going to have rest. Every time you turn around, it's going to be World War III. You know what that means? I need that sword to come into my life. If I've got a bad temper, you can't talk to me, I'll blow up on you. You know what needs to happen? That sword needs to come into my life. You get rid of it. If I give up, lay down, that sword needs to come and deal with me and strengthen me. I want to lead my family closer to God. I pray one day if I have grandchildren that these boys will be able to lead those kids even closer to God. But you know what? It's got to start with somebody. And it's got to start now. It's got to start today. I want to ask you if you would to stand with me this morning. Listen, this is what the Lord has put in my heart. God created family. And we could see mirrored in that family the love and the order of God. Let me just say this to you as I give this altar call. No family is perfect. You say my family's got problems, so does mine. You say my husband has issues, so does hers. I promise you. I'm the worst case in this room. But I ain't giving up on what Jesus can do. There have been times I've had to come to my wife and weep and ask her to forgive me for things I said, for things I did. And I'm so thankful for the grace of God in her heart that she has been able to forgive me. But the enemy wasn't able to destroy. There's power in forgiveness. If you can't lay things down, if you can't forgive, the enemy's already got you. He's going to destroy your home. You have to forgive. You say you don't know what they did. Turn your eyes back to Calvary and look what they did to the Son of God. You can forgive. You can move on. You can be healed. Let His blood be activated in your life. Let it cleanse you. Let it help you. Forgive one another. Move on with God. Your daddy's not perfect, neither is mine. But he's my daddy and I love him. Your mama's not perfect, neither is mine, but she's my mama. And I love her and I'm thankful for her. Your kids are not perfect, neither are mine. But I can tell you, they're my kids. They're the best kids on this earth. If you ask me, and I will fight and I will give my life. My wife, what a blessing God gave me when He gave me that woman. And I'm not alone. I tell you what, you're blessed this morning, man. You're blessed this morning, ladies. This is what I want to do. I would just like to give an altar call for families. Again, if your wife is here, wives, if your husband is here, would you come this morning? And I just want you to hold hands and I want you to pray and I want you to talk to God together. If there's trouble, Listen, if there's trouble, give it to Jesus. Because we're going to make it. We're for each other, not against each other. You're here this morning. Your spouse is not here. Just come and pray before the Lord and pray for them. Ask God to move in their heart. Ask God to move in their life. Just let there be healing come. And we just hold hands together and ask God, Lord, strengthen our home. Would you tell that person in your life that you're thankful for them? Thankful for you? Would you tell them? The 
by the grace of God, I want to be what you need me to be. I'm asking Him to help me. Hey, listen. Children, if your parents are here, would you come and just get with your parents? And I want you to put your hands on them and pray for them. Would you come pray for your parents? If your family matters to you, would you come and pray for your parents? Just get around them and lay your hand on them and pray. Just ask God to move. Ask God to help. This is a time of healing. I know the Savior's in the room. The healer's in the room this morning. Just ask God to move in it. Ask God to help. Commit yourself to God this morning. The enemy's not going to use me to attack my family. I'm done with it. I'm done arguing. I'm done fighting. I want to walk with God. I want to walk with God. I want you to walk with God. I want to know the peace of God. I want to know the rest. Open your heart. If He needs to touch you with a sword, let Him do it. If He needs to touch you with His sword, let Him do it. Attitudes in your heart. <laughs> Leave it in this altar. Put it under the blood. Give it to Jesus. I'm not going to be a tool for the devil. I'm going to be a tool for God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, have Your way in these families. Have Your way in these men, God. Make them the husband that You call them to be. God, help us. Help us, help us. Lord, help these women. May they be the wives You created them to be. Let them know, God, their, their husband needs them more than they know. God, strengthen them to be that. Lord, we pray for our children here today, God, that You would touch them and help them. God, that they would know even at times we fall, we're not perfect, but we do serve a perfect Savior. He doesn't give up. He doesn't quit on us. We're not quitting on each other. Families, we're not quitting on each other. We're in it for the long haul. Just for a moment, could you imagine what it would feel like to walk through those pearly gates holding the hands that you're holding right now? <laughs> oh my God! Can you imagine what it'd be like to enter into that city of God with your wife, your husband, your children and say, Oh God, we made it! We made it home! Well, that's what you're fighting for. That's what you're fighting for. That's what the devil's fighting against. You can make it. You can make it in the name of Jesus. Commit yourself to one another. Forgive one another. Love each other. Just like Christ loved you. wife here and you you have a husband there that's doing his best to follow Jesus. I want to tell you you've got a rare treasure. Because a lot of men ain't doing that in this hour. And if you've got one that is, you're blessed. Encourage him. Support him. Don't fight against him. Y'all move together with God. Men, if you're here today, you have a wife that wants to serve God with you. She loves Jesus. She loves you. She loves your family. She's faithful. Then you are blessed. Because a lot of women ain't that. They ain't that. Love her like Jesus loved you. Think about how many times, men, Jesus has covered you. He covered your failures. He covered your flaws. He never mocked you or made fun of you. Be that to your wife. 
Wife, be that to your husband. Oh, let's stand together. Oh, my God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Believe for each other. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Great day of healing in this house. Let Jesus touch you. that have come to pray, would you just kind of press in a little bit this morning? Come on. Richard, Terry, Ashton, y'all come on. Y'all come and press in. Press in if you can. I want to pray. I want to pray for God's help in our